All right, so thank you for coming. So uh, my topic is conformal bootstrap and Tauberian theory. So uh, I will mostly speak about modular bootstrap today, but uh, in principle, the story is uh, more general. Uh, so uh, in conformal bootstrap, uh, we are exploring uh, conformal field theories by uh, imposing uh, some set of uh, very general constraints like crossing unitarity and symmetries uh, and uh, uh, trying to see what it tells us about conformal field theory and uh, in general of course it's a very hard system to solve because you have an infinite number of equations on an infinite number of unknowns and so only in some rare cases you can exactly solve it uh, and so what you typically do is you take some limits of a crossing equation and then that allows you to explore some small corner of uh, the Hilbert space. And so uh, briefly what people do uh, can be summarized on a uh, plot where we label uh, primary operators in the conformal field theory by the scaling dimension and spin. And so uh, we have uh, a unitarity bound and where this region is uh, disallowed. Uh, and then we have different methods to cover different patches of this uh, plot. So for example, for small uh, spin and small dimension, uh, there, is a, uh, there is numerical uh, algorithms which are extremely efficient and can give you scaling dimensions and OP coefficients with many uh, decimal digits. Uh, so that's one region. Uh, another thing you can do is you can take a uh, light cone limit of the crossing equation and uh, explore uh, this limit of large spin fixed twist when you go off parallel to this unitarity bound. So here we have region uh, which is uh, considered in Lorentzian uh, light cone bootstrap. Uh, and so uh, the story which I want to tell you about today would be a complementary region to these two uh, where we uh, consider a large dimension and uh, finite spin. And uh, I will argue uh, that here a uh, sort of a good ideas to use are these uh, Tauberian theory ideas. Uh, and so uh, here uh, I should uh, make a distinction right away uh, that uh, so in these two regions what people do typically is that they can tell you uh, a list of operators and OP coefficients uh, in some approximation. Uh, and the story I'm going to tell you about today in this region will be somewhat different that I'll tell you about some sort of averaged quantities where you average over some operators like microcanonical entropy and uh, things like that. Uh, so that's a distinction. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, this region will come from arguably the simplest limit of crossing equation. Uh, the idea is that if you just take the crossing equation where everything is Euclidean, so the simplest case possible, and you take a limit of uh, OPE in one channel where you have some singularity uh, let's say coming from the vacuum and then you try to uh, ask so uh, what does it imply about some tails of the sum in the cross channel and so what does it imply about heavy operators in the other channel uh, so that's the idea and uh, uh, so and questions like that uh, have been studied by mathematicians for over a century and they uh, often go by the name Tauberian theorems and so uh, just again to, to give you a flavor, so a typical example of, uh, of a theorem uh, like that is uh, this Hardy uh, Littlewood uh, Tauberian theorem, uh, which uh, states the following. So uh, suppose uh, that we have a sum, uh, a series expansion minus an x. Uh, and suppose we know it's asymptotic uh, when x goes to zero. And so, uh, and it's singular, it's uh, let's say one over x. Uh, 
And so uh, this large asymptotic should now be reproduced by some tail of, uh, of this sum. Uh, and so uh, what you uh, would like to say that somehow, uh, so if you set this coefficients a n to be one, then you would exactly reproduce this sort of singularity. Uh, but of course, you cannot just say that all of a n's one, uh, but you want to say that on average, a n should be one in order to have the singularity. And the theorem states indeed that on average, in this uh, precise sense, uh, the coefficients a n's are uh, one when n goes to infinity. Right? And so this is, a, and this is a typical uh, sort of result in this, uh, uh, in this business. Uh, so uh, one important thing to notice here is that a crucial uh, condition under which this uh, statement is true is that a n should be uh, positive definite. Uh, and this is very important. Uh, so uh, intuitively, uh, suppose we uh, didn't have this condition and allowed a n's to be negative. Uh, then let's say we found some set of a n's which satisfy this asymptotic. Uh, but then we can imagine uh, that we make a n's uh, bigger in one in some places, but then negative in other places, and then it, it can still satisfy. Uh, we can still satisfy this asymptotic. So that uh, sort of shows you that if a n's are not positive definite, then there might be different sets of ANs which satisfy the same asymptotic. Uh, and so you can think of this as uh, like uh, degeneracies for OP coefficients. These are like conformal blocks. And this is like the cross channel. Uh, and so uh, statements like that uh, I will discuss in uh, the, uh, in, uh, for modular bootstrap uh, and even more fine grained statements of this sort. So that's uh, the idea. Okay, uh, so now let me uh, move to uh, uh, discussing uh, uh, my main example, which is modular uh, bootstrap or modu just modular invariance of uh, 2D CFT. So it's a very uh, sort of standard story. We have a 2D unitary CFT. Uh, on a uh, which we put on a torus, and uh, for simplicity, we consider just the simplest case where you have a rectangular torus, and we have uh, a very standard uh, modular invariance condition uh, by rotating and rescaling this torus. We can relate it to a torus with a different temperature, uh, and so uh, in equations, this uh, is stated. Uh, by uh, this condition. Uh, and uh, as usual, if we take uh, beta going to zero, uh, we have the vacuum contribution. Plus, uh, plus heavier operators. And so uh, from this, uh, we somehow uh, would like to conclude that the density of states is uh, given by Cardi formula. Uh, but so now let's try to be a little more careful and see so how uh, we would uh, get this formula. So. Uh, what we would do is uh, uh, we would like to take the, uh, this equation and take the inverse uh, Laplace transform. Uh, where we integrate with beta delta and we integrate this uh, vacuum uh, contribution. And indeed, if you just compute this integral, you would get a formula like that. Uh, However, a region uh, when beta goes to be large and imaginary here is not under control because uh, here, uh, so you have other contributions from other operators. Uh, 
for example, the first excited operator and so on. And when beta becomes large and imaginary, these become of order one. Moreover, the degeneracies grow exponentially and this whole integral diverges. And this is, of course, uh, good news, in fact, because rho of delta is a sum of delta functions, so it should be uh, sometimes infinite. Uh, so that's actually good that this integral diverges. Uh, and of course, what you actually want to, want to state in this formula is that you have uh, a microcanonical entropy or uh, a microcanonical density of states where you integrate uh, in some uh, window of energies and you would like to make a statement like that. But now the question remains, so uh, how do you derive a formula for a quantity like this and what, uh, and what is uh, exactly the answer? Uh, well, no, the, the region of convergence obviously doesn't include x, x equals. Uh, yes, I guess I would just assume the simplest thing that it's uh, absolutely convergent uh, up to x equals zero, but not in x. It is imprecise though, that's what I, I'm trying to argue. Uh, uh, you mean the saddle in this just first term? If you take vacuum and compute the saddle? Uh, so you're talking about? Uh, yeah. Right, right. It's imprecise because you're assuming that rho of delta is a smooth function. But if I want, uh, if I have a discrete spectrum, that's not uh, exactly true. Uh, and so here I try to argue that uh, by, uh, yeah, let, let me just stop at that. that uh, here, I think the imprecise part is that you can't assume that rho of delta is a smooth function and just Uh, it, it kind of makes sense because you cannot uh, buy, uh, I think a m yeah, m more sort of better uh, way naively would be to take this inverse Laplace transform, but then I, as I explained, it's not, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't give you directly uh, what you want, but later I will show that this intuition will help us uh, and we will improve sort of on this kind of argument. Uh, right. Uh, so that's the setup, and uh, now uh, uh, now I'll uh, tell you how. So how do we uh, derive something something like that? Uh, so the idea is the following. So. Uh, so we would like to uh, bound a number of operators in, uh, uh, in this window, delta minus delta, delta plus delta, uh, which we would later multiply by the density of states. So now let's imagine we bounded this, uh, uh, this step function by some smooth functions, okay, uh, which I will call uh, phi plus of delta prime and uh, phi minus of delta prime. Uh, so uh, I have my uh, theta. Uh, 
uh, my step function, I am uh, bounding it by uh, phi plus and phi minus. Uh, then uh, it will also be convenient uh, without loss of generality to multiply this thing by exponentials so that it's easier to relate it to the partition function later. So for example, here we can multiply by this exponential and uh, it's, uh, it's, this inequality is still true because this exponential is uh, larger than one uh, in this region. So it's an exponential like that. So you can multiply it uh, on the right hand side and similarly you can uh, multiply uh, by this exponential on the left, which is just like, like this serif, and it's smaller than one in this region. Here, here, uh, delta, small delta changes sign. Yeah, yeah. So now we just multiply by the density of states and integrate over delta prime. And so uh, in the middle, we get the uh, desired quantity. Uh, and on uh, here, we get an integral over uh, delta prime. Uh, there's a, a factor out front, and we get an integral over uh, delta prime. Uh, we have density of states minus beta delta prime times this uh, kernel which we introduced. And the uh, similar thing here where you uh, substitute delta by minus delta and phi plus by phi minus. Okay. And so uh, now we would like, because we know something about the partition function, we would like to relate it to, to it. And so uh, this part looks almost like the partition function, except that we have this kernel. Uh, but now we can simply take the Fourier transform of this phi plus uh, and we and the integral over delta prime would produce the partition function. Uh, and so uh, the bounds, so for example, let me uh, focus on the upper bound. And so the bound becomes an integral over the Fourier modes of phi plus. Uh, we have the Fourier transform of phi plus, phi hat, and we have the partition function at the temperature uh, beta plus it. And we integrate over all Fourier modes. And there is a similar lower bound. Okay. Um, so this is a formula. Uh, so now uh, notice that this formula is very reminiscent of this Lop inverse Laplace transform. That we take the partition function and we integrate over the imaginary temperatures over T. Uh, however, uh, in that formula uh, on that board, the troubling region where T goes to infinity uh, kind of uh, messed up things for us. But now we have this uh, kernel phi plus head of t, which is totally up to us, and, and which uh, uh, we can choose in such a way as to uh, cut off the troubling region. Uh, that is, this formula suggests that we should take phi plus minus of head of t uh, to be of finite support. Excuse me. Uh, yes, that's right. Sorry, yeah. Th there is an extra factor, uh, beta delta, and there is uh, some factors from the Casimir, uh, from the shift of Casimir, minus delta minus c over twelve, and there is a minus i t c over twelve. Yeah, there are some factors like that. Uh, uh, so now this is an improvement over that inverse Laplace and by choosing phi plus minus hat to have finite support we can simply cut off the region which was troubling for us. And 
now we can have full control over the integrand uh, by just low uh, dimension operators. That's one thing. Uh, so uh, another thing is that, so you would expect that if you uh, try to uh, squeeze uh, the step function further to make it very, very narrow, uh, then because you're trying to get very fine-grained features of the spectrum, uh, you shouldn't be able to control it by just the vacuum in the dual channel. Uh, and indeed, here, if you squeeze it, then phi plus minus become localized in delta prime space. And then it, their Fourier transform, phi hat, becomes uh, delocalized. Uh, and that means we again lose the control over the integral because we are sensitive to large imaginary uh, temperature uh, uh, limit. And this formula kind of quantifies uh, this intuition that we can now tune it as to optimize uh, the, the bound. Uh, yes, so, uh, yeah, so essentially uh, this is the formula which will help us to derive Cardi formula. Uh, so now, so this formula is true for finite delta, everything is finite. And we have some parameters which we can tune, like beta and this function phi. Uh, so now let me uh, show you how this formula leads to a, a more rigorous version of uh, Cardi formula. So now uh, we would like to take the limit when delta goes to infinity and uh, um, and I will later choose beta uh, to be small. Uh, beta is uh, a parameter which we can choose. Uh, and so we expect that uh, the universal contribution will come from the uh, vacuum in the dual channel. That is we take this partition function we uh, dualize it, use modular invariants. Uh, then we uh, split off the uh, vacuum contribution here, uh, plus the rest, which is uh, I will denote, which I will denote z heavy. Uh, and uh, for uh, Technical reasons, uh, I will assume that operators contributing to the heavy are heavier than C over 12, uh, but it's not too important. You can include uh, lighter operators. It's, uh, let me just stick to this case for now. Uh, so now uh, this quantity, uh, so this Z heavy, at the moment, I'm considering all operators, yeah. But in principle, the story can be repeated for uh, only parameters. Uh, here, I will, uh, no, here I'm including all operators and I'll assume that, uh, in more generally, you have some finite number of terms here from lighter operators, but they do not uh, change the story very much. Very important here. Uh, so now uh, this will give us what we want, and this we need to estimate. So uh, the absolute value of this thing. Uh, so first of all, so because it's a sum of exponentials of this effective temperature, we can estimate it by getting rid of the phases first. So we just take the uh, real uh, uh, value, the real part. Uh, and because of this uh, assumption, since so this thing can, uh, contains terms of uh, the sort, uh, this effective temperature times delta heavy minus C over 12. Uh, so uh, then this thing is just dominated by its value uh, 
on the upper bound for t. Uh, so th there is a heavy here. So we can estimate it by uh, just the value at the upper bound for t, which is uh, lambda, which is this lambda uh, from the support of phi. Uh, and so uh, now, uh, since beta is small, uh, which was my choice, and lambda, I will choose order one. So we have this effective beta, which is small. So now we can, again, uh, dualize this temperature to estimate it. And so the uh, dual thing is 4 pi squared divided by this effective uh, beta. So uh, my estimate from dualizing then is this inverse times C over 12. And since beta is small, I can also throw out this beta squared. So the estimate is simply this. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, so now uh, let's stick this all back into uh, this formula. Uh, so we get that uh, this uh, microcanonical density is uh, less or equal. Uh, so uh, we have some uh, beta delta out front. We have some rena remaining integral over t uh, for uh, the vacuum contribution uh, times the uh, kernel. Uh, and we have the contribution of all the heavy operators, which we estimated as beta delta from the prefactor plus uh, lambda squared over beta times c over 12. Okay. So that just came from uh, this formula. So now this integral is just explicit integral and for some reasonable choice of this function phi hat, which I will make, uh, which I will specify uh, later. Uh, so this formula uh, simply gives, uh, you, ju you can just compute by uh, saddle approximation and you simply get uh, this value on the saddle which is just t equals zero. Uh, there is also some uh, uh, factor from the integral over fluctuations and uh, the value of phi at the saddle and plus the contribution of all the heavy operators. So uh, now we can see that uh, in this formula, so uh, if we would like heavy operators to be suppressed, we simply choose lambda to be smaller than 2 pi. And uh, heavy, heavy operators are suppressed. Uh, and the formula we get uh, is as follows. So, uh, right, so also beta is, the, is a free parameter. So just by optimizing this exponent, uh, you can uh, choose uh, beta. And uh, as expected, it's just its thermodynamical value. It's just the standard relation between temperature and energy. 
Um, and so what you get is uh, you get a bound by the standard uh, Cardi formula, but uh, multiplied uh, by these uh, uh, values of the kernel at zero. Uh, where row zero is the uh, is standard uh, Cardi formula with the prefactor. Let me uh, so that's uh, yeah, that's the this one formula. Uh, the only job left sort of here is to choose uh, to choose these functions uh, phi plus and phi minus with the uh, uh, with the declared properties. Uh, and so, uh, so in our paper, we, uh, well, we came up with some uh, functions with these properties. Uh, they're not uh, most optimal ones, and uh, the problem of uh, making it uh, as optimal as possible is still open. Uh, but just to give you a sense of uh, what these functions look like, uh, they're just some uh, uh, Functions uh, like sync, uh, like sync function, uh, for example, we found that this one uh, is uh, more optimal among the functions we uh, considered, and there is some similar choice uh, for phi minus, which is not uh, terribly illuminating. Uh, yeah. Big delta, little delta. Little delta. Uh, it is uh, almost arbitrary. I'll specify that you cannot make it too small, and I'll specify exactly what I mean by that. It is arbitrary here. If, uh, yeah. Well, rho of delta is the sum of uh, delta functions. I, I'm considering a discrete. Uh, which thing? This thing? Where is the little delta here? So, for example, it is here that uh, in these functions phi plus and minus, that these functions phi plus and minus, they depend on little delta uh, on these sides. And uh, in fact, I'll show that if I make small delta too small, smaller than one in particular, uh, then this bound will become negative and we don't have a lower bound actually. Uh, that this has finite pre uh, I mean, it, it's, uh, uh, I don't think I can take free atom from this thing uh, uh, on the on the spot but like y y you know just the simple just the sync function is a Fourier transform of uh, like this of, of uh, so that's an uh, similar So, sorry, maybe you, you are not satisfied no, by my answer. Ah, ah, okay, perfect, <laughs> perfect. So yeah, so let me actually discuss now in a little uh, more detail uh, how what happens with this phi plus and phi minus. So uh, a little. Uh, uh, let me yeah. So let me uh, write this formula in a uh, slightly different form. So it's uh, instead you can consider uh, sort of microcanonical entropy, which is just the uh, 
logarithm. Uh, and then, of course, you get uh, the standard contributions. Uh, just one quarter, uh, 48 delta cube, uh, plus the remainder term, which I will call small s, which is related to logarithms of this uh, phi hat things. And so then the bound which we get from this, uh, from this particular choice of functions uh, phi, uh, if we study it dependent on small delta, and uh, we study this remainder term. Uh, so for the upper bound, you get that it's uh, something of this sort where it uh, becomes uh, some particular number, which is not very important. Uh, and for the lower bound, you get also some number like minus 0.7. But then it, uh, the lower bound diverges at some delta minimum, okay? Uh, uh, which uh, for our choice of function was like 1.1 or something. Uh, so uh, an important thing about this graph is this divergence w uh, at some finite uh, value of uh, small delta. Because uh, what it tells you is that if you take small delta to be uh, larger than this minimal value, then you always have a lower bound on the, on the entropy. In other words, if you take your window to be large enough, then you will always find an operator in that window, at least asymptotically at very large uh, scaling dimensions. Uh, That's correct. Uh, for this case, it's trivial, but you can uh, repeat this whole thing for Virasora, and it's uh, essentially the same, and you get the same bound for, uh, for primary, for only primaries. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. So. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, 3D Paul, Paul, who is not here today, he uh, showed that uh, the uh, minimal uh, value, uh, he came up with this function phi minus such that the lower bound is still positive. Uh, and he showed that uh, the minimum uh, size of the window for primaries is just one. That asymptotically, if you take a uh, window which is larger than one, then you will always find the primary operator in such a window. Uh, and uh, yeah, this was uh, derived by, by, by 3D by uh, choosing this function phi minus in some more clever, uh, more clever way. Uh, yes, that's a great question. Uh, uh, but so far, yeah, I haven't, well, uh, I, I don't know how exactly you would uh, impose uh, something like that. So the first thing you, you can do is to just impose like a twist gap that you say there's no conserved current. But then, uh, at least naively, uh, so uh, there was a paper by 3D a few weeks ago where he considered a 2D version of this uh, with a twist gap. Uh, but still, yeah, he, he, wasn't, he didn't show that it becomes very small. It's, uh, it's still something of order one. So it's an open question. Oh, I mean the, uh, I mean like 2 d has spacings of order one or, or like monster. Yeah, you, you want an example of, uh, so you want some non-integral example where Yes, I, I, I don't know. I, I think no such example is known. It's, uh, that can be, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I don't, I don't know such function. Um, 
Right. Uh, right, so that's uh, one thing. And uh, so, uh, so uh, I'll uh, end with this discussion for now and uh, uh, move on uh, to a, a window of a different size. Uh, so another uh, thing you can do is uh, you can uh, uh, consider a uh, window, uh, you can consider a window of energies which uh, scales with, uh, with delta, with some positive power. And uh, you can still think of it as uh, microcanonical entropy as long as it uh, scales uh, with some power which is much smaller than, uh, 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 than the energy. And uh, in that case, you can uh, slightly, you can improve these uh, estimates on the, on the errors. Um, and in, in fact, you can get another uh, term in the entropy, which is, uh, which is universal. Uh, and actually in this uh, setup, uh, it is uh, sort of more related to the type of Talbirian theorem, which I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, so here uh, you can prove sort of a, uh, an equivalent statement to discussing this kind of window. Uh, if we consider a, uh, this sort of global uh, average uh, of uh, hardy littlewood type, uh, and then you can prove uh, a theorem that uh, this thing is uh, 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 has some universal form with the uh, with the with the bounded uh, error term, and uh, right and uh, so the claim is that this quantity is related to uh, the microcanonical density, uh, which is. Uh, uh, in which we take the window small delta to scale with large delta. Uh, and so uh, now na naively you can take, you might want to take this formula and to just differentiate, take a derivative over uh, big delta. Uh, but that's not quite good because uh, so uh, on the right hand side, we have a sum of the smooth function, which is the leading term, plus the error term, and the error term is not necessarily smooth, smooth because this whole function is not smooth. Uh, so for example, if this r remainder term is some, something oscillating, like a sine, let's say, of delta, then if you, if you take a derivative, then it doesn't become smaller. It stays of the same order. Uh, so you cannot simply take a derivative of, of this formula, but what you can do, of course, is you can just take the uh, finite uh, difference in this formula. Uh, and then uh, what you end up getting is, well, the first term uh, just gives you at large delta the derivative of the smooth F0 times two delta. Uh, but the second term stays of the same order. Uh, second term stays of the same order, which was F0 of delta, which is the leading term, times the error one over square root delta. And so uh, this thing is also uh, F0 of delta times delta minus one half. Uh, and so we still have control over this quantity only if small delta is large. Uh, that is, if delta, if this small delta is still bigger than one, much bigger than one, then this quantity, this large, uh, this first term is dominating, and uh, uh, and we uh, have control over this uh, microcanonical uh, density of states. 
So now using this formula, we can uh, derive an analogous, uh, uh, an expression analogous to that formula on the left for the entropy. And uh, you again get Cardi formula, you again get the uh, log piece. Uh, but then you also get an extra piece, which is also universal. Uh, Uh, and you get a remainder term, uh, which is suppressed by one over small delta, which, which comes from this enhancement by small delta. Uh, so this piece is also universal in the sense that it depends only on the central charge, but uh, also it depends on our choice of the uh, window uh, over which we are averaging. So, uh, just to give you an idea of how you would uh, derive uh, this formula, I'll just sketch it briefly. So, uh, th this statement was kind of uh, the leading piece was actually known. Uh, it's known as Ingham's Tauberian theorem uh, for large Laplace transform. So what we did, we kind of uh, gave a different proof where we can, we were also able to estimate this uh, error, uh, which allowed us to write this uh, microcanonical entropy. Uh, so the idea of the proof is kind of in the spirit of, uh, of uh, conformal bootstrap, is that you take the crossing equation and you apply some linear functional to it. So. Uh, our crossing equation is simply uh, the modular invariance equation that we have uh, the partition function uh, and the difference is zero. Uh, and so the uh, linear functional which we apply to, to this uh, is to integrate over some uh, uh, complex contour uh, with uh, this uh, particular kernel and times some function of z, which let me not discuss at the moment. And we're integrating again over some uh, imaginary axis uh, from beta minus i lambda to beta plus i lambda. Uh, and it looks sort of like this, that in z uh, plane, uh, we have this sort of contour. Uh, beta delta, yes. Uh, this delta will be related to this delta. So I'm trying to uh, sketch the duration of uh, this formula. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, uh, it's a z delta. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry. Right. Uh, so now uh, the idea is that uh, so uh, uh, this partition function, if we expand it in terms of operators, will have terms like minus z delta prime. Okay, and so uh, when uh, delta is uh, bigger than delta prime, this exponent will be kind of small. And you want, uh, if, you, uh, if you deform your contour to the left, so you want to 
to, to deform your contour to the left. And so you deform it to uh, this sort of contour. But then on the way, you pick up a pole from z equals 0, which comes from this one over z. Uh, and this pole uh, is what produces you this uh, theta function of data, uh, theta of delta bigger than delta prime. And uh, this uh, theta function is sort of what cuts you to this region from zero to delta. Uh, and then you have to make some choice of this function f of z so that uh, you get some good, uh, so that you get some uh, good bounds. Uh, So that's sort of a uh, sketch. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, I guess, let me just um, mention. Uh, so, so this sort of, I guess, uh, I'll uh, end the story about large delta with this. And uh, so one more comment I wanted to make is that, so we have these uh, uh, bounds on the number of operators, and those bounds are in principle uh, uh, valid for uh, finite delta. And uh, uh, so in principle, you can uh, use those uh, constraints uh, uh, to get some interesting bounds uh, on operators at finite delta. Uh, if you knew something about uh, the contribution of heavy operators into the partition function. Uh, uh, and indeed such a uh, bound on heavy operators uh, exists and uh, it is this uh, HKS uh, bound and uh, uh, that uh, that is sort of another uh, thing which would be interesting to explore whether those bounds have uh, interesting implications for uh, finite uh, delta if you use this uh, sort of HK, this HKS bound uh, uh, where you bound heavy operators in terms of light operators and primes mean uh, the dual uh, channel the beta prime for example Z uh, is for pi squared over beta. And uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, here I discussed the story for uh, uh, all operators, where I sum over all operators in the theory, both primaries and descendants. Uh, but it can be, uh, first of all, generalized to, uh, for example, primary operators. Uh, you can also talk about holographic uh, theories where you, uh, at large C, where you have some sparseness condition and so on. Uh, then you can talk about four point uh, in 2D and, and so on. There, there, there's uh, many uh, generalizations. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, and I guess, uh, and let me just conclude, I guess, uh, by saying that uh, an interesting question would be what uh, Juan mentioned that uh, if you could uh, somehow find a proper set of uh, additional uh, conditions on the conformal field theory, which would uh, make rigorous this uh, intuition that somehow you should expect a, a very small spacing between operators if the theory is not integrable uh, and, and, uh, yeah, and, uh, and derive some uh, and the matrix uh, properties or something like that, that would be strange. Ah, uh, yeah, if you, yeah, yeah. The, no, that, that's a, yeah, that's a, a little far-fetched, but that's kind of the big dream, I guess. Uh, and let me just stop here.